Welcome to the Web Platform Podcast, a developer discussion that dives deep into all things web. We discuss topics relevant to developing for the modern web and the web platform of today, tomorrow, and beyond. This is the Web Platform Podcast, episode number 106, ARIA for Developers. On our panel today, we have Justin Ribeiro. Hello, wonderful people. Danny Blue. Hey, everybody. First time appearance on the panel, Brian Cardell. Hello. And myself, Eric Isaacson. And our guest today is Marcy Sutton, who was previously on our show, um, but like two years ago almost. <laughs> I'd say it's been quite a while. It's been, it's been a long too time. Long. Hello, See, this, people. Uh, you've done a lot since then. Um, your career has kind of just skyrocketed. Can you kind of tell, tell us a little bit about what you've been doing, uh, where you've been, and where you're going? Yeah, man. Well, since, since 2014, I guess, was that the ages last? Ages ago, yeah. Ages, yeah. That's in, in internet years. That's forever. Um, yeah. So I've changed jobs a couple times. I work now at DQ Systems, which is an accessibility company, which is awesome because I don't have to convince anybody that accessibility is important. We're all on the same page. Um, so I went there to work on developer tools for accessibility, which was sort of a dream job. Part of that includes evangelism, so I get to go to conference talks and write blog posts, and things that I would be doing in my free time anyway are now part of my job. Um, I did a short stint at Adobe for a little bit and decided that I, it would be a better fit to work on these accessibility tools, so that's what I'm doing now. Um, but, yeah, I guess when we talked the last time, I was working with the Angular team quite a bit and not really doing that as much anymore. I'm more framework agnostic, trying to solve problems more in general r rather than focusing on one framework. Yeah, you, you did um, the material design stuff, I think. You yep. did docs with them, and then you had NG Aria. Um, and you also were a speaker recently. We were just talking about uh, React Rally. Yeah, that was the first my first foray into React testing, and um, I'm going to do some more of that here pretty soon. I'm sort of trying to balance a lot of things, and um, I do have some more Angular talks here in the next two weeks. So since React Rally, I've gone back to Angular to try and get some more research done there and get my talks ready. Um, so it's a bit of a juggling act, but I think there's a lot of interesting problems on all of these frameworks, and so there's no shortage of material for me, which is really cool. Pretty excited. Awesome, but sad at the same time, right? <laughs> it's been great. I, I wish I had like twice the amount of time to do everything, which, you know, that's never how things go. Um, but it's exciting either way. I'm, I'm stoked that I get to try different tools. I was thinking to myself, too, about this episode and what we really wanted to cover. And ARIA was one of those things that I thought was so important because you know, when we're building web components now, we're trying to think of, you know, at least I am, um, and I know a lot of others are, trying to think of, like, uh, keyboard accessibility focus issues, um, contrast with colors. I wanted to get you here because I know that you, you know a lot about all areas of, well, not all, I would say all, but most at least uh, areas of web accessibility. And, um, and Brian uh, coming on, too, to help with some of the questions because he has extensive knowledge in... Uh, accessibility as well, as well as like almost every other part of the web, I think. Yeah, Brian knows a lot more about standards than I do. I've sort of uh, been observing the web standards stuff, but focusing more on the developer track and just being more, I don't know, business oriented, I guess, rather than standards oriented. So it's awesome to have Brian here with us today. Hell yeah. Yeah. I wonder if we should start by talking about what ARIA is in case people don't know, because I feel like we throw it around a lot, that term, and people are like, what is that? And I end up explaining it a lot just because we want to bring people along and make sure that they know what we're talking about. <laughs> so ARIA is, stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications, and my interpretation of it is it's a standard set of attributes to help you expose accessibility information in HTML, SVG. Um, so you can't make up your own ARIA attributes. There's a standard set. I think that's one thing I've seen people do. They'll like make up attributes or make up roles and can't do that. Um, but what it can do for you is expose some of the information that you would get from, say, a native button element or 
let's see, what's another one? A link or a list or all of these things that you can put in HTML and use the native things. If for some reason you can't use the native thing, you can use ARIA to expose that information. Uh, but the big caveat and the elephant in the room when we talk about ARIA is that you might not need it at all. So it's really like an advanced topic, and it's something that you shouldn't reach for first. You should reach for the native element first. And maybe you guys can, we can talk as a group about why, why you want to use the native thing first. Yeah, that's a good question. Why, <laughs> why, would, why would you reach for ARIA when you have a, a native element? So like, let's talk about button because that's one that comes up a lot because it's such a simple seeming thing. And uh, yeah. if you add a role button, does that actually make it a button? Like, does, does, is it as good as a button to say role equals button? That is a very good question. I had that same exact question, too. Yeah, I can take that. Um, so it's only, it only gets you part of the way there. So the native button element is focusable by default. It shows a focus style. Um, that's probably the biggest thing that you'd be missing, say, if you put roll of button on a div. It wouldn't be equal to a, a button element right away because a div isn't focusable. So you would need tab index. You have to manage the tab index. It doesn't have all of the same JavaScript event hooks that a native button would have. So a button can be invoked with a keyboard. It doesn't have wiring into forms, for example, right? Exactly. Yeah, there's a lot that you get for free with the button that you wouldn't get just by putting a role of button. So all the role will do is tell assistive technology through accessibility APIs that, hey, this element is a button, but it doesn't come with all of this other stuff. So because that's sort of a minefield of support that you might not be aware of, that's always why we say start with the native thing, because there's so much happening under the hood that you might not be aware of. And disabled is a really good example. You can use ARIA disabled, but it's not the same. So then where is the disconnect currently sort of in the developer sphere of things? Because if, if we talk about using sort of native elements as they sort of exist to us in our setup tools, why do developers sort of feel the need and sort of shy away from using those native elements as we've sort of seen? Like, why is there a reason that, you know, we can put role equals button on something like, um, uh, a link or something within a list like an li um, you know is there is there a value there that doesn't exist within the native or is you know have as people have, have developers in general lost sort of that native feel because they they missed something out of it to begin with i think part of it is styling and this it used to be a lot harder to over override the styles of a button i know back in like ie6 days um, so that's probably the most common reason I've heard is like, well, styling a button is hard. And it used to be a little harder than it is now, but now we do a lot harder things than overriding the style of a button. So there's sort of no excuse anymore. But another re reason I've run into having to like trade out semantics, you know, one for the other, is if you're layering on top of a third-party library, say foundation in its older version, um, the API for that foundation component set, they would only bind to certain elements. And so to make a, a carousel or drop down or whatever component you're wiring up, if that underlying third party library has limitations, you're kind of in a bind and you can't use the, like, the ideal element. So I think there's all kinds of reasons why people need to reach for these tools. Um, but somehow we learn about them without learning all, like the whole picture, and so you go to use it and just layer it on there, and you have no idea what it does. <laughs> so that's, that's it's a minefield. I think Eric actually mentioned uh, <clears throat> something that came up uh, like very recently. Some accessibility people gave a sort of a report to the W3C tag, and it's one of the things that. Leone had summarized was um, basically people have this misunderstanding that you can just add a role button or the, uh, a role main or you know these different things and without a lot of the information about like why you would do that and what that means if you misapply some of those attributes you can actually take something that um, otherwise would have been pretty accessible and make it less so. And that's uh, like, that's a concern. So how can you 
like, are there tools or um, like quick ways? Because learning is clearly not as easy as we would like. But are, are there kind of quick ways that a developer can have people or uh, something point out to them, um, like a lint, right? A, a, a lint. Yes. I'm sort of setting you up with the softball answer here, I know, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, there are tools, and I work on one, so I am obviously going to talk about that one, but there's more than one tool. So Axe is one tool. It's A-X-E, if you go to look for it. Axe Core is what it's called on GitHub. Um, and that's one example of an accessibility API that will go through your document and find, like, hey, did you spell an ARIA attribute wrong, or did you misapply it, like put it on an element that it's not allowed on, or you're missing, maybe it's a composite, uh, role and it's like if it's a menu and it needs other things to go with it Yeah, if you can use a tool to help flag that for you I, I, I feel like that's starting to iron out this problem a bit for developers because going to read the aria spec is like ah, Sometimes so if you have a tool to point it out for you I think that's we're, we're finally filling that gap a little bit and making it easier to figure it out It's a really good way to like reinforce um to reinforce learning. You know, one, one way you reinforce learning is by doing, but the reason that works is because you eventually learn that you're making mistakes. But if you have like a good lint tool or a compiler or, you know, there's lots of things we've learned in engineering that just here's a good way to point out to you before you get too far that you probably did something wrong. And I feel like for a long time, Aria was lacking that. And sans that, it's like just up to us to hope we did it right. And um, I, I know since I've been using a lot of tools, it's actually helped me a lot. Yeah, there's um, there's a number of accessibility checkers just in browsers, or not checker, that's not really the right word, but like an accessibility inspector, if you could look at it in your browser. And Safari has one. I didn't actually didn't even know about it until the last year. Um, but you can basically go inspect the DOM and see what the computed roles and names of things are. And tools like that are making a huge difference. Because if you could go and inspect ARIA the same way you would inspect styles or, or JavaScript even, um, I feel like that's sort of leveling the playing field and giving people way better understanding of what it's actually doing. So when you say computed, you mean like that it's, it's kind of like... Um going underneath and saying, hey, I recognize this part of this. I recognize that it will have focus. It will, it will do all these things. So you could sort of figure out the differences in each browser as far as how it interprets a role versus how it interprets a button by doing that? Yeah, so it, it really depends on the browser and the platform exactly what it will compute to. Um, but for any element, um, and, and maybe it's important to talk about linting versus testing a rendered DOM. So if you're going to lint something, like in your text editor or your IDE, um, if you were just going to run some checks against like a, an HTML file just like loaded locally on your machine, um, there's a limited set of rules that you could actually run because it's not being rendered in a web browser. So styles might not be applied. JavaScript might not be applied. So we can't run the full set, like, say, for color contrast. In your text editor, color contrast would be a hard thing to check because it's not actually, like, applying the CSS in a browser. Um, so what we want to get closer to is having it either through automated tests or in a browser extension actually run a set of tests against your rendered DOM because there's all different scenarios that can change the rendered page. Because like, that's the closest we want to get to, is test it the way the user is going to see it in the browser that they're actually going to be seeing it in. So while we love Chrome, Chrome isn't that widely used by people with disabilities. So we tend to check in Firefox, Safari. Um, so that's why tools in browsers that people use for accessibility are really important, like Safari, even though I don't know. We all have our opinions about Safari, but it is really great with VoiceOver, the screen reader. So having tools in the actual browser and being able to check it as it's rendered in that browser is really important. And um, yeah, roles, for as one example, can be impacted by quite a few things. Like if you have display none in your CSS, it's maybe not as relevant to go check what that element, um, like what its computed role is, because the screen reader is just going to skip it. 
Yeah. I, I probably should have been clearer when I said Lint. <clears throat> um, I was not really thinking of text linting, but that's a really good point. <laughs> I was thinking more like, you know, uh, the, it, it, it is a good point that you make that uh, what we're talking about here is really in the browser, something that can go and do tree analysis and see the actual the thing in context. Because as Marcy said, CSS, what CSS is applied matters. Uh, what ancestor attributes are in the tree really matter. Um, uh, you know, lot, lots of things like that matter. And the, the nice thing about a lot of the tools like Axe, uh, Axe can let you uh, test a particular thing in the page in context, but only test that thing if that's what you want to test and not get all of the noise from anything else. Um, and uh, there are some other really nice accessibility tools. I like uh, Google's uh, plugins in Chrome, I think, uh, and the new accessibility inspector um, that they have. I think those are really helpful. Um, they work like a performance audit, like you just effectively set up the scenario, you get the UI in the state, and then you say, okay, how to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, because they're more like generally purpose than Axe, like Axe probably does a better job and can uh, like weed out more noise than uh, the other ones. But uh, you know, if you if you have nothing and and you suddenly get those tools, you're, it's like putting on a pair of glasses for the first time. I don't know how many people wear glasses, but you put on a pair of glasses for the first time and you say, wow, is this really, holy cow, I had no idea. This is um, what the browser was doing for exactly. us. It's and very, the, very it's enlightening, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think back to when I got started in accessibility and without having those tools, it was really a guessing game about like, okay, I'm going to put a, a role onto this element and I guess it'll work because I read the ARIA spec, and I think that's where people would, like I remember somebody, it was a JavaScript framework, um, it was really early days um, for me on Twitter, but I remember them getting kind of called out for making up roles, and I think without the tools to show you that that's invalid, like with any sort of a, a browser tool, it's really just guesswork, so it's not guesswork anymore when you can see how it gets applied, and the Chrome Accessibility Inspector is new, you have to enable it as an experiment, and um, I have a link to that in the resources for this podcast. But tools like that really help you see, like something like accessible name calculation for a button, which is an algorithm that you don't want to have to go read the spec to like step through. Okay, well, is Aria described by getting applied here? Or, like, what's happening? Does placeholder work? So having it exposed to you in the browser tools is awesome. Yeah, and it's it's um. You were saying, like, kind of need tools to do a lot of this stuff because it's not like if you add an invalid role that it doesn't work. That it doesn't work for you. You'll still see everything render just fine, and everything will kind of. If you're not actively testing for it, it will still look like it it works. So, like, the, you know, the browser itself doesn't tell you, hey, you've added a role here that technically doesn't exist. So it's almost necessary to have them. Um, but I also think that it's. Well, it's really cool to have, like, uh, we've been talking a lot about how, the, so the button is the really good straightforward example, right? So how a native button and a div or something else with roll of button, how they behave differently. But um, one of the other things that's also helped me is how people that, so people that use these accessibility tools, what those, how those tools treat those, treat those different attributes. So actually like turning on a screen reader or something like that to actually be able to, and so sometimes that'll give you a little bit more insight as well. It's just like, okay, this is what, this is actually what this is doing. The tools make that much, much nicer, but sometimes you can't, sometimes you can't beat, it's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to turn the screen reader on. Let's see what the screen reader does with, uh, with all of my stuff, that can also be a pretty invaluable experience for anybody that is trying to figure out how a lot of this stuff works. Oh yeah, that's super important to say. Like we're talking about tools and browsers, um, but it's really a shortcut for testing. 
that is not a replacement for actually testing it in assistive technology. Um, and getting people who actually use it every day to test it. Because like, I've seen testing teams that are not super new with accessibility. They're like a little farther along the maturity um, in their organization, but they it's really easy to misunderstand the purpose. So for example, um, I've seen testing teams um, expect the tab key to, you should be able to do everything with the tab key. While that might, like that's a good start, but not every component uses the tab key. Sometimes it's the arrow keys. Um, sometimes it's the space bar. Um, it just depends on the element, so I think there's a big part of it that you can only get so far with these browser tools, and you you have to like actually test it in a screen reader too. Yeah. So that is really important. I, I think it's kind of um, maybe a, a good uh, analogy is is just when you're unit testing your your application, you're unit testing it to try to catch some of these to catch some of these mistakes, but it doesn't mean you can't still test it as well. It still has to go through the entire process. Like it, it, the, the situations are, are a little bit different, but I think it's a it's something that, you know, for somebody that has no experience with it, maybe it's a an easy comparison to make. I thought unit tests were sold to us as like the end all be all. Wasn't that the thing we all decided several years ago? Test, test, test everything. Out, test just goes out the window. Integration <laughs> tests. <laughs> hey, working on the server, the CI built. I'm fine. Let's ship um, it. Web oh, um, <laughs> There, there was one other thing that I wanted to mention uh, about that as far as the, uh, and that actually kind of plays into it, Justin, that you're not doing this stuff because so like a lot of these tools and it'll say like, hooray, that you've, you've pa you passed, you passed the, you passed the ARIA test or something. But uh, Marcy, like you said, it's not, it, it, you're not building this to, ch to make the little light green on your, your, your test spec. You're doing this so that, pe so that more people can have access to the thing that you're trying to make. And so I also think that, you know, like, yes, like, it's, it's very important for, you know, organizations to start getting used to this stuff, but, like, this is one of those, like, where, like, the end goal, you cannot lose sight of what the actual end goal of doing this stuff is. Exactly. Yeah, the end goal is to make it usable by humans and humans with disabilities. And there's so many different kinds of people that same two people might look at your interface and test it and completely like disagree on how it might work. So it, it's good to get a sampling of different perspectives and how they use it. And um, But there, there are some similarities between like the programmatic unit testing. Like if I can operate it with the keyboard in a, in a test, that's going to highlight some really important um, aspects of making it accessible. But yeah, in the end, it's, it's really all about making it usable by a person. And, and a lot of people have a misunderstanding that this is sort of a growing segment of people too, right? We have an aging population. We have a significant amount. You know, it's, it's not a very black and white thing when we talk about accessibility. I think a lot of people think that it is. Um, you know, there is a lot of call for accessibility, particularly in everything from municipal governments to, you know, your federal things, where things must be significantly more accessible. Um, are developers getting on board? I mean, we've talked a little bit about the spec. Um, specs can be hard to sort of uh, grok and understand from a developer perspective. We have, you know, a finite amount of time. Um, the tools have gotten better, but are developers sort of adopting these newer tools? Are they starting to adopt the conventions that make things more accessible today? I think it's getting better. Um, I've, I've certainly seen a really good response to videos and blog, blog posts and conference talks, um, but I'm just one person, so it... I've heard it both ways. I've heard um, the ad adoption is slow. I've heard some pushback um, from different parts of the world. Like there was an article that just went out. Um, it was like the inaccessible web and how we got into this mess. I think it went around quite a bit in the last couple of weeks. And the author, Misha, um, wrote to me and said, hey, I'm getting a lot of pushback from people saying, like, this is too hard. And so she's actually written a follow-up article to say, no, it's really not that hard, and here's how you can do it. Um, so the pushback exists. I think people are afraid in some cases, or they don't have enough budget or enough support. And I think it just takes persistence and really bringing people along. So when I talk about accessibility, I try to make it inclusive and approachable and fun even, 
and not as much of a legal risk and scary thing. Even though those are elements of it, there is legal risk. Um, but make it more, like, make it something that people want to pick up because it matters and people matter. And so that's been my approach and it's gone pretty well. Um, but it is an ongoing challenge. Well, and I, I think there's a, I think there is a really sort of a disconnect between developing something for people. Um, I, I feel like a lot of the pushback that I hear when, not just for things like accessibility, but for just other technologies as a whole, like, oh, I don't want to do that. It's very hard. I don't understand when it, when hard became a thing that developers complained about. So what is the hard? It's kind of your job. Like, aren't we, we here to build things? <laughs> we, yeah, we do a lot of things that are hard, like in, you're, you're building for users at the end of the day. And to sit there and go, oh, I don't know how to solve that problem, or oh, I don't want to read that or understand that. It, to me, it's a little frustrating to hear that because I, I question, or, or do, do you want to do a good job? Do you remember who you're delivering for? Um, when people lose sight of who they're delivering for, the reason that they ship, I think that pushback come, becomes much more prevalent. Oh, I just need to ship it because someone told me to ship it. Um, do not lose track of your user. Um, is what I try to remind people to do because that is very frustrating. Yeah, there's, there's a lack of empathy there too in a lot of cases. You know, you have you have um, companies saying, you know, <clears throat> you know, our users aren't disabled. We don't, you know, we'll have a very small percentage. It doesn't matter. And uh, the the fact is, it's you know, they think of disabled as this tunnel vision. This is what disabled is, but it just helps everything if you think about it focus do we need focus as you know as a user for the application yeah typically in the on the web in a form you'll need to use focus at some point you know you'll need to have keyboard shortcuts for these things because you don't know how your users are going to do this and you have to kind of put yourself in their place um you know, that my would father require measurement and thought eric do we get yes. a lot of measurement? <laughs> but the problem is that um, you know a lot of people in project management don't see that as you know I'm not saying like a lot, but there are many people that I have met that <clears throat> have said we don't care, and they won't care until it comes down to money, until like oh we're being sued quickly let's prioritize this and put this in the queue. Yeah, it's, that's, that's how I do all my development, only by <laughs> lawsuit. I only develop what I get sued for. It's that's, sad. It's a new rule. It is sad. I totally agree with you. So I think that, um, <clears throat> like, w one of the things is, um, I don't think that we've done a good job, like, exposing historically. And I, th I think in the past maybe two or three years, we've done a much, much better job. But I don't think that we've done a good job exposing really what accessibility means and why you should care. Like um, you were saying, we have an aging population. Um, I think some of the best examples are like, um, hey, have you ever like broken your mouse? <laughs> right? Um, broken well, your arm. You may not actually even yeah. have a, a, a physical disability. There are, you know, there are people who cannot use the same things for lots of reasons. You can break your arm, you can, you know, injure your eye, you can like He's holding a baby in one arm. Exactly, right. Um, there are lots and lots of reasons why these are important. And when you start to think about how they affect people, I do think that you're right when you say, um, like, we have not we, but at large, enough people who have enough decision-making power get a concept in their head about this is what disability means, and I quantify that in my head to a number that is vanishingly small, and I can get away with not doing that. Um, but, and yes, that totally lacks any kind of empathy. But And we'll come back to it in phase two, right? Right, exactly, exactly. Um, <clears throat> we'll come back to mobile in phase two. Oh, God. Right. So <laughs> I, actually, that's actually interesting that you bring that up because I was, I, I was going to circle that in, which is, uh, you know, you see a similar thing happen with, like, responsive design where 
like for a little while people said well that's just too hard like we don't think that way we nothing is built that way we don't um but if you look at it there's a lot of interesting correlations between the two of them and how you think about things and i think actually that uh responsive design sort of mobile first has actually helped the accessibility uh definitely movement absolutely a lot of the same sorts of things that you will do for mobile first also happen to be very, very good for accessibility, right? Thinking about when you squish your screen down and you're dealing with a very narrow set of things really like forces people who don't typically tab through to think about the tab order because that, you know, the, their document order, those things, suddenly that becomes very important. Um, thinking about things in sort of like simpler, more descriptive ways that fit on a mobile screen, that's actually very good for accessibility. So um, I think in the past couple of years, a number of things have happened. Uh, we've gotten some really good advocates who are doing great presentations at major events. And I think people see, wow, I this is kind of cool and it's also achievable and doable. Uh, we've gotten like better training. Uh, uh, Alice Boxall and uh, Palmer's uh, Rob Dotson did a training on Udacity that's free. And uh, I think that's excellent. Um, other, you know, we, we've tried a number of other sort of free things. That's just currently my favorite one. Um, uh, and tools. Like, I think it's sort of like the confluence of those things that has really given us an opportunity to really upgrade our, uh, you know, our really up our level in accessibility across the board. I think all of those things. Yeah. I think it makes it more, um, like approachable for the average developer to just pick it up. So say you work at a big organization and like they're not giving you much time or budget to work on it. If you make it like a checklist that people can go and you know figure out what exactly they need to do as a developer and really empower each individual developer to do something about it, that's how you can make these small wins and actually make progress. Um, I just talk to um, Tim Cadlick and Katie Kvalson, Kvalchen, I don't know how to say her last name, um, the Path to Performance podcast, we talked yesterday about you know, making it so that you can prioritize a list of things like you would do with performance to then take to the higher ups at your company and say, hey, I have this prioritized list of things that we can assign you know, estimates to and actually show you know, tangibly what it's going to take to add accessibility to your application I think it's sort of a grassroots effort that each of us can do our part to to actually implement accessibility at an organization that otherwise, you know, if you have to convince your boss, it's a lot easier to do that if you have, you know, an estimate, something to work towards. And so rather than making it like nobody's responsibility, making it easier for each developer, each designer to do their part, like you can kind of win people over in your organization. Hopefully, like in my La La Land ideal world, <laughs> that's how it would work. But it has worked a little bit. Yeah, I think change is hard for companies, and their culture will definitely have a huge influence on that. So, like, you'll have to work within your company and, and figure out what are the low-hanging fruits that we can slowly integrate into our normal day-to-day, -day, right? So, so like, at here, here at Carfax, um, what I've been doing is just going through, <clears throat> doing simple things like alt tags, skip links, you know, um, and trying to come up with templates for these. If we're building components, to have like a, a generator or something that I could just use a command line, it'll generate a whole bunch of files and set up everything for you. So, the develop so it's easy for developers, they have no excuse, right? Something in project management, if you have Jira or something, you can, you can create uh, templates for that, where in the acceptance criteria, it'll have certain things already pre-populated for accessibility. Stuff like that makes it really easy once you understand what you want to do. But <clears throat> get, getting that, excuse me, into your system 
you know, within the company is that's the harder challenge because people are used to doing things a certain way. Yeah. I feel like the, the, the hook that I'm really trying to get to is like getting through to developers so they can take that information back to their company and try to chip away at that process and be like, hey, I really care about this. I heard about it at a conference and we can do some stuff with this. Um, and yeah, you, putting tickets in Jira is a really great, or GitHub is a really great way to start. Um, but yeah, it's going to take more than just one person to actually move the needle on it. And yeah, that's sort of the, the tricky challenge is getting that buy-in at a bigger company. As a developer, if you just use that whole philosophy of clean up the code when you leave, you know, the smaller things can be handled in, in that way. <clears throat> leave it better than you found it. Yeah. Yeah, I think the challenge is that like we can learn how to be web developers without learning about accessibility or ARIA at all. Like I didn't learn about it in the first few years I was a developer. It took getting onto a client project where that was required because they'd been sued. Um, and so it's like it's never too late to start. And I think that we can all sort of do our part to help everyone around us know that it's important. And well, Brian and brought up something too. I'm sorry, Justin, but Brian brought up something too about the the tooling and how it's changed and. I feel like since we've had you on last, there were only like a handful of tools that were really useful for accessibility. You had Steve Faulkner's plugin for, for, the, for the browser. You had <clears throat> 10 on IO from Carl Groves. It was just sort of coming out. But um, you know that was one of the first more JavaScript-y ones that I saw. And yeah. now we have stuff like I never heard of X until, geez, like two months ago. And um, <clears throat> I heard you on JS, JS Air with Kinsey Dodds. And uh, there was a couple of other guests on accessibility. And that was a really good episode. I put that in the show notes for this one, um, where you talked about Axe. And one of the things I started implementing it in a project we have here. And one of the things that I found really nice was it's just so easy to make these plugins for it, to do whatever you want to fit it into your development system. So I think I think that's going to be super helpful. Now, when we deal with like, you know, JavaScript, we're dealing with asynchronous code, content generated by JavaScript. You know, how do we, <clears throat> how does ARIA content um, help us with those sort of things, or does it provide extra value for something like search engine optimization? Um, you know, things like that, so that we, you know, we can further uh, further help along. Um, I guess metadata would be probably what I'm thinking of. It certainly could. I mean, depending on which part of ARIA you're you're talking about, but for things like icon buttons and you know interfaces mm -hmm. that maybe work with the mouse and have click events attached to them, but I mean they have to be focusable with the keyboard. But anything that's focusable also needs you know a name or some alt text to be exposed when the user tabs onto it, as well as making it. Like there's three big parts of that. It has to be focusable. It needs an accessible role like button or link, and then it needs some text in there. And so, in the example of an icon button, it's really easy to just go add some CSS in a JavaScript click event onto any old element um, without thinking about you know what's the text exposed on there. And so, if you were using something like Aria Label, absolutely um, adding text to something that would otherwise be missing it could help. It's something like search engine optimization, just because you're putting more content into the page. Um, so yeah, there's there's plenty to think about, and I think there's lots of different angles that you could integrate this into your process. Like if you're rendering your application with JavaScript, um, you probably well you need to test it after it's rendered and attached to the DOM, as we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, but there's a number of ways that you could test that using automated tools. You could write unit tests that you know, either use the Axe API or maybe you're using Tenon, which is a very similar accessibility API. You could have integration tests that use Selenium WebDriver. Um, you could use browser extensions to do it sort of manually. So I think there's a number of ways that you can test stuff like that. It's just you, you sort of have to know that that's a thing that you have to cover in the first place. If we, like we've already said that you should reach for native elements um, because while it's not impossible uh, to, it's not impossible to make things accessible, and in a lot of cases, it's not even that hard. Sometimes it is hard, and it 
it's not necessarily trivial to get right. And I'm just wondering, like, uh, web components seem like they offer a really good way to sort of declaratively package up uh, something that's in, you know, we have ARIA patterns already. There's ARIA best practices that talk about all different sorts of uh, UI interactions. In fact, I think that's really why we wound up with ARIA in the first place is that people were taking it away from just the document nature and building things that were more application-y traditionally. So we had things like tabs and accordions and dialogues and things like that. And um, <clears throat> I'm just thinking, is there a good opportunity for us to lower the bar still further to say, um, here are good accessible solutions for these patterns where, you know, rather than here's a very complex recipe and as long as you follow this, you know, 300 pages of spec advice, you're, well, it'll probably work. Um, to, to just say, like, here's the tag for that thing, and if you use that, um, you're guaranteed the same sorts of things that you're guaranteed with native elements. Uh, it's just who's making the guarantees is different. Yeah, I like that idea, and it sort of tags on to uh, what Eric was saying about, you know, what if you could have a generator that would just, like, output something for you, and I think custom elements are in that same vein. Um, Rob Dodson wrote an article recently about some of the value in web components, and it really seemed like pattern libraries um, where maybe you just want to have a declarative set of elements that people can consume. Um, that would be a good mechanism to do that. Something that I would like to see evolve is not hinging everything on JavaScript. So part of the challenge, I think, I mean, it's early days, so like we're relying on polyfills, yes, and we need the browser to actually support things like custom elements, but even once it does support them, I still have a bit of um, like concern that we're going to be hinging so much off of JavaScript. So I'd be curious to hear like how you see that evolving. Um, so all of the app-like things that we have in ARIA, like it would... It's currently impossible um, to do any of those without JavaScript. Like you, you, you can't make uh, <clears throat> you can't make most of those things without JavaScript. They involve making sure that you handle focus ordering and keyboard capture and, uh, like you said, it, it's it's non-trivial in the sense that um, you know if you add a roll button to a link, it doesn't suddenly take on all of the traits of a button and just become a button. Um, similarly, there's lots of patterns in uh, the ARIA best practices for things that are more appy, and at least currently there's no way to do that. Um, even a lot of simple things, there's no way to do them without JavaScript. You need JavaScript to manage your ARIA roles. I don't, I don't see that as especially problematic. Um, you don't see it as an issue to, that we would need JavaScript to render anything at all? Because I feel like that's been a concern of JavaScript frameworks in the last few years. Like the big elephant in the room for me working on Angular was that everything required JavaScript, like rendering anything at all. It was right. like taking me back to Flash days. <laughs> but yeah. we're, getting, we're getting more evolved there, how you can server render things. Um, sure. you, know, you can use Node.js to render the same JavaScript app on the server so that at least that initial load, you have something. Yeah. So I'm curious if we'll be able to get there with web components. Even, like, I get that things that are really interactive are going to need JavaScript. But right. that's, that initial render of content, I feel like the consumers of web components might miss that, that distinction between this is really app-like, so sure, it can use JavaScript, but we want to use custom elements for this simple static thing. It's like, it seems like, I don't know, I just, I want to see us evolve that story so that we aren't relying on JavaScript to render everything, because that feels like we're repeating the same problem we had with JavaScript frameworks. What, what's, an, what's an example of something real simple that you would see somebody wrapping up as a custom element. I'm, I'm just curious, because like, well, I have a hard time understanding that. 
Yeah, I guess the I've been able to wrap my head around lately. Um, there, like some news people have been using custom elements, um, but they need static content, to, like to get the news delivered to everyone. The only way that the Seattle Times, for example, could use custom elements was to have a compile step, so that they could actually, like, they can use the declarative language, so that you know news producers who know a little bit of HTML can you consume these custom elements, but then the end, um, when it's delivered to the user, it's already been compiled into something that doesn't require JavaScript. And so that just exposes it to be able to be viewed on way more devices and way, by way more people. Um, so I'm really just like thinking of this consumer, you know, the person who's, who might not be as technical, who's, but can use the custom element in a CMS or something, versus the end user who, like, we're putting a pretty big burden on them by, you know, shoving them these heavy JavaScript-required components. Sort of challenging this. I know custom elements are like, I was really excited about them, too, and I'm like, wait, are we going backwards? Did you read the um, article? I, I know I shared this with Brian, but Jeremy Keith wrote a, a blog post on, on um, I guess, web components that were not uh, necessarily progressively enhanced, right? So, like, to your point, you know, custom elements. I, I love web components, obviously, but there is a problem where if if the browser doesn't support it, you don't have polyfill, then what happens? You don't get anything. Like, nothing. Like, it doesn't even go to, like, a span, because everything is run by JavaScript, right? Yeah. So that's a problem. And, <clears throat> you know, when we have stuff like... um where you can have declarative images, let's say, inside of there, and you design your components in a certain way, you can get rid of some of this stuff. For instance, having his example in there was a carousel. And the carousel is like a wrapper with images that you would put in. Those images are slots, right? So they get put into the web component. But if it doesn't support it, like the, the browser meaning, then you'll still have the images. You'll have the alt text on them. But it'll look really bad, but at least you'll have the content. So something like that you could do now with these things, but I'm hoping that uh, V2, whenever that happens in five years or ten years, will have um, <clears throat> more of a, a, a holistic look at that. I don't think it changes over time. Because I think at any point in time from just the history of the web, right, we've had different, we've had varying experiences. Basically, you can you can call it whatever you want. You can grade browsers. You can you know a certain you know a, a to f right of what experience you get as a user by using that thing. My experience in Firefox or Chrome is not the same experience I'm going to get in the links, right? Um, but yeah. do we build our components, whether those are web components or custom elements or in some whatever fashion they may be, in a manner that takes into account that sort of progressive experience? You know, yeah. um, you may not get the entire full wave experience. I may not get the interactivity of my carousel, for instance, right? But I'm still seeing the end result of the content that I want to display to an end user. Um, I don't think that changes from a components perspective um, sans the fact that we end up with poorly designed components. Um, you have to step back from that thing and say, how am I going to make this accessible and usable and as as deeply as I can go for that thing. And I, I think we've seen that time and time and again for the web. I mean, look at, look at the, the sort of the plethora of jQuery plugins that exploded, right, when jQuery uh, really came onto the scene and sort of resolved a lot of problems right. um, that we as web developers had. Well, the problem also became was that there was a lot of inaccessible things in that got generated too. They were horrible plugins. Um, you know, they mucked up your DOM. They, 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 did, they did things that they probably shouldn't have done, but they got that user to an endpoint. It's just that usually you needed an A or B experience, and the CDF users didn't ever get that experience. So I think you're always going to have good components, and you're going to have bad components. And as engineers and developers, it's sort of our job to sit back and or stand back for a second and say, what is my landscape of the thing I'm building? How can I build it in as an accessible way as I possibly can? Um, you know, and is am I am I going to still still have a forward thinking approach, but still have that fallback? Yeah. Uh, I don't I don't think we get away from that on the web. Um, I think it would be very difficult to do over time. And, and different people at any given point in time will agree on what's an acceptable level of good. 
Um, <clears throat> and it's not always the same answer for the same people either. Um, like you, you could make a, you could make a case that um, you are kind of going overboard if uh, you know you have a like something that's for your hotel that needs to work on your hotel Wi-Fi. There's really no reason for it to work on a you know a 2G connection because well it's like that that's not you know that that's not the thing. So if you, if you really know your parameters. Uh, there are plenty of cases where you can uh, make, you know, where you can make your own decisions. I know, like, intranets still, like, probably kind of dwarf, uh, like, the outside web. Like, there's just a ton of it. And they have the ability to make different sorts of decisions than, uh, you know, things that are out there in the open web um, that need to be for everybody. Um, but I think, uh, you know, the more experience we get, the, the better, uh, things we'll do that thing about progressively enhancing with custom elements. I think, uh, pretty sure I'm on the record for mentioning that in like 2010 or something like that. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so, Yay, good job, Brian. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I think that's a really good idea, but I also think that it's like, important not to get too afraid of things because everything is a balance. Um, uh, one of the things that I'm really, really interested in is the incubator community group and um, how we get better at doing this because um, ultimately standards have been really bad at making good markup uh, like we have the main element that, um, if you're not familiar with the main element, Aria has the role main that identifies, like, curiously enough, the main content <laughs> of your uh, document. Um, and it's had that for a long time. And some people suggested that we should have that as a tag because it is like a thing. It makes sense. That should be a tag. Um, and as it went through standards, um, the Wedwig version of that doesn't actually match the ARIA version of that. And uh, you have tags that seem to say one thing, but their intent is actually not the one that a lot of people think it is. So the incubator community group, I think, is how we can do better at that um, and use custom elements to figure out what those things should be. Um, and it would be great if, you know, like a lot of elements were progressively enhanced. It may be the case that for some of them, that's not going to work out. But having the ability for us to iterate and have some space where, uh, unlike just a vanilla open source project, um, we're coming together for the purpose of, like, we, we need a standard around this. We just don't know what it is. And we, we need to experiment. Uh, having the ability to experiment seems like a really big deal to the future web for me because I would love it if you could get to the point where those patterns that Marcy's saying, well, yeah, but you need JavaScript for them. You currently need JavaScript for them. It would be great if we could get to a point where you didn't need JavaScript for them. Or <laughs> if you did have JavaScript for them, it was browser JavaScript that wasn't user JavaScript. And experimenting is, I think, a... a I agree. I think experimenting is key, and the, I, the the ICG comes up a lot on the podcast these days. It seems like everybody sort of says, "Hey, come and join us and do this." And you should. Uh, there's always a link to the the incubator group in the uh, description. Uh, but experimenting has become sort of a big deal, um, both from a browser vendor standpoint to a, someone who wants to get started in the standards track these days, whether that's for accessibility or web components or whatever uh, and it's it, it, it's starting to bear fruit to some extent right we've got a lot of sort of ideas that have come from developers who have problems that need to be resolved uh, and I think that's key to making the web as a whole much better on the note of the roles too like like not to not to stray away from this a little bit um, because I mean as far as that goes the what you were saying Brian I, I agree 
it's not the whole the whole story as far as like um, okay well you know, I, I just want to see the content anything that's important to the user should show right I don't expect a custom element to work in IE5 you know I expect the content to be there though I expect the important meat and potatoes to work and I'm looking now at the at the roles for design patterns and widgets in aria and <clears throat> I love this is something we didn't have like two years ago when I spoke with Marcy last time. Uh, and we said, oh, wouldn't it be great if we had more developer stuff? And Steve was like, yes, I'm working on some of that. And you know, over the past two years, a lot of design patterns in UX outside of this have changed, right? So what happens if somebody puts in the hamburger menu into the spec and then you know, two years from now, the hamburger menu is no longer relevant, does that change to accommodate something else? Like, or is that even an issue? I don't know. I think it, it has been in the, in the past, like you, you can use the example of main, right? So uh, the original purpose was you would attach it to anything, a div or paragraph, whatever, that would identify your main stuff. And then we had the main element, which really you should be able to assume is main. But even during the time of implementation, you have to have the main tag with the main role in order for everything to be able to understand it in the interim. And then now I think going forward, I don't know, Marcy, you probably know better than I do. Like, is a main tag at this point equivalent or? Everywhere but IE. So edge exposes the role, i.e. 11 does not, and, and, and i.e. anywhere below, you still have to bolt on the role. So if you're supporting any version of i.e., you need role, main with role equals main, which is a bit of a bummer. Um, but if you're not supporting i.e. and you're only doing edge and then everyone else, you can get away with just the main element. Department of Redundancy Department. Yeah, exactly. I, it, yeah, it's a bit of a, a challenge. Um, but that's legacy stuff for you. I mean, that's just kind of the way things go sometimes. Could be that's, worse. That's why it's important to sort of have these tools that will show you exactly what it's exposing um, in the browser that your user would be looking at it in. Because if they're using IE11 and you just go to use the, the main element, um, you might assume that it's exposing something through accessibility APIs, but you actually have to go and test it. And so in, in older versions of Internet Explorer, you could use the A-Viewer tool from Steve Faulkner. That's a desktop application for Windows um, that will actually show you what the accessibility APIs are producing, um, whereas Edge, the newer browser, has accessibility tools built in. Um, for older versions, you have to go use tools like A-Viewer. I think that's a really interesting thing that gets sort of under talked about um, is, uh, you know, we, we've sort of brought it up about why you need to test in context, but I don't think that it's like self evident or well explained, like what the layers of things are. So like you have the DOM and you have CSS and then you have Aria is on the DOM, but the thing that it's actually creating is not the DOM, right? It's the accessibility yeah. tree. Yep. The accessibility tree is the thing that's exposed, and how it's exposed and everything is like even beneath the browser, right? Like how in a, a, a tool that you're using, in many cases, that's like OS level, right? Like, yep. Accessibility APIs, and there's a couple really great articles if you're if anyone's interested in learning more. Um, Leonie Watson wrote a Smashing Magazine article called "The Key Accessibility APIs: The Key to Web Accessibility." I think, um, and then there was one recently that uh, the title was "What Does Accessibility Supported Mean?" and it really hits on this idea between Internet Explorer and Edge, and how I, I, it was mainly talking about how Edge um, is a hundred percent supported or whatever, but that's the browser exposing everything correctly, whereas, you know, JAWS or MVDA, they have to make use of, of those things that are exposed. So the browser is doing all, it's can, all it can, and now these third-party tools need to take advantage of it. Um, so there's some good articles um, that, yeah, if you're interested in learning more, I would suggest reading those, and I can dig up the links for the resources.
that's been kind of messed with the mind of a lot of people that I've talked to who, um, you know, we're used to working with the browser and we look at things like the CSS acid test where you have a picture of a smiley face or something and, you know, like it should render exactly the same in all those browsers. And like we, we get used to this, well, it works exactly the same way in Chrome and Firefox and Safari. And um, people uh, I talk to frequently have a misconception that you can open up JAWS and point it at any browser and it should work exactly the same way as NVDA in any browser. Or if you can somehow imagine using VoiceOver with any browser, um, like IE. I'm not sure how that's possible, but um, <clears throat> can you talk to that a little bit and maybe clear up that? Yeah, well, I think we're running a little low on time. Seems like um, Eric was saying he might have to jump off. Um, Eric, do you want to comment or wrap it up? <laughs> um, we can answer this, this question and then uh, wrap it up. OK. I'm sorry, was I supposed to answer that one? Oh, it, was really <laughs> it was really to Marcy, because I think she probably is in the best position to explain. Can you, I was looking at Eric's face the whole time you were trying to go, eh? <laughs> Can you rephrase the question? Sure. The, the question was um, that there seems to be a misconception by a lot of people that um, <clears throat> accessibility tools, like with screen readers, for example, are the same in the way that browsers are the same. So if I pull up a page in Firefox and I pull up a page in Chrome, I can look at the two of them and they should be basically indistinguishable, right? I can tab like browser engines. things should be basically indistinguishable, right? So uh, I know a lot of people expect that they can open JAWS or VoiceOver or any of those things and they will have a like identical experience because underneath is the same ARIA. Mm -mm. No, so it depends on the browser. Um, it depends, I guess, yeah, like Firefox on a Mac does not work with, with VoiceOver at all. It just doesn't expose the right information. Um, Safari and VoiceOver work a lot better together. On Windows, JAWS and NVDA have, you know, I hate this phrase, but your mileage may vary <laughs> um, because of the way that these things are exposed. And so it really takes knowing what your users, like what browsers they're using. And in the case of assistive technology, um, you might need to look at something like the WebAIM screen reader survey to see what the popular versions are because you can't track. Um, there's no analytics for screen readers. Um, but they are not always equal. They don't all, ex like browsers, don't always expose the exact same information like Chrome versus Safari. Chrome does not expose everything that Safari does. Like in the case of a field set, it just doesn't work in Chrome on a Mac like it does in Safari. So they aren't always equal. Um, and so I think that's why the context is really important to know what your users are using. And within accessibility, we can narrow it to commonly used combinations. Things like Safari and VoiceOver, NVDA and Firefox, JAWS and IE, and when you start to mix and match those, it really is not predictable at all. Like NVDA um, and IE, actually NVDA works really great. Um, I've seen some challenges with JAWS and Firefox together, um, especially with JavaScript events. If you're doing things for the mouse versus the keyboard, it can get really challenging. So that's why we always recommend these common combinations. Do you have a, a URL thing that has a list of those things? or? Uh, yeah, sure. I can link to it in the resources. Um, the the WebAIM screen reader survey is one of the best things that we have because users have self-reported that, you know, I use this browser. Um, and so that's one of the best resources. All right. I think that's about um, the end of the time we have, unfortunately, because this has been a really good conversation. I feel like we could go on for another three hours. <laughs> so. I can't. Um, I'm out of coffee. I'm out of coffee, <laughs> Eric. I have to refill this cup before we continue. <laughs> that's exactly why I have to go. It's just coffee, right? <laughs> I'm don't not take working. my thing. Don't don't know. No, don't take my thing. <laughs> I need coffee. coffee. <laughs> that that is your thing. All right. So this has been episode number one hundred and six. Aria for developers. 
Thank you so much, Brian, for jumping on. Thank you, Marcy, for being our guest today. And it's great to see you again. It's been like so long. I can't believe we've been doing yeah. this podcast that long. Even. Yeah. <clears throat> it's been crazy. Well, thank well, you. Well, thanks for the co great conversation. Yeah, maybe we'll do a part two in a little more maybe breadth or depth, depending. Sure. Because this, is, this is really awesome stuff. All right. Thank you. Thanks. You want to learn more about what's coming on next on the Web Platform Podcast? Follow us on Twitter at, at the Web Platform or on Google Plus and YouTube at Plus the Web Platform. We also need your help in creating transcripts of the episodes and helping to create open source projects under our GitHub organization. Contact Eric Isaacson at E Isaacson or Danny Blue at D underscore Blue. That's D E E underscore B L O O. Thank you for listening, everybody, and we'll catch you all next week.